ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I apologize for speaking in English, but it would not be much fun for you if I spoke in French. Um, I'm, uh, the rector remarked that I don't come to Paris that often. I don't think you can ever come to Paris too much, so I'm always pleased to be here. Uh, I was just reminiscing that the first time I came to this building was in May 1969 as a student. So, as you can see, I've always been a year too late. Uh, uh, but I, it was quite uh, exciting even then. Um, uh, as Louis mentioned, I brought out a book recently on strategy, um, and it covers... Uh, not only the military sphere, but the business and political, and indeed the social sciences as well. And I'm more than happy to talk about those other areas, but I thought today that I would concentrate uh, on the um, military side. It seems appropriate, given the other lectures that are coming up. But the general ideas that I have on strategy um, are, I think, applicable to these other areas as well. And what I want to do today is give you a brief uh, historical outline of the development of the idea of strategy from the Napoleonic times to the present day, um, and then consider some of the dilemmas that this has created in terms of our conceptual understanding. The word strategy itself uh, comes from the Greek strategos, the art of the general, um, and I think it was always very much bound up uh, with political as well as military leadership. For most uh, of the uh, period after classical times, the word was not used books about strategy would be described as the art of war, uh, or people did talk about tactics. It came into use in France um, initially in the late 18th century. It reflected an enlightenment view that all areas of human affairs should be subject to reason, to science. Um, that even war, with, it, with its chaos and violence, was as likely as not going to be shown to be for, able to follow certain rules, certain laws, that if you understood, you could become even better at it than your opponent. And of course, it gained currency, as a word, with the Napoleonic Wars, because in the wars that followed the French Revolution, Napoleon, with the levée en masse, was able to do things that previous generals had not been able to do. He seemed to have found ways of using armed forces uh, that, that demonstrated that with the true military genius, uh, extraordinary things could be made to happen. And that if only this, the principles of Napoleonic warfare could be understood, then the clues to strategy would be found. And of course, although we now remember mostly Clausewitz as the great interpreter of this period, the most successful interpreter of his time was Baron de Jomini, Swiss, who um, fought largely with the French until, until the end, um, who, unlike Clausewitz, lived to a good old age, uh, and whose book, The Art of War, is, was seen at the time as the textbook on military strategy. And he and Clausewitz um, had a degree of interaction. Um, 
But in a way, for the time, Jomini had the last word. And though Clausewitz in the United States may now be seen uh, as the great exponent of the theory of war, you can trace American military thinking much more to Jomini than you can to Clausewitz. But Clausewitz, the Prussian, is the one who had the most dynamic and elaborate theory uh, because he died of cholera at a relatively early age, uh, his work was unfinished, which of course allows for all sorts of possibilities of interpretation. But actually, both Clausewitz and Germany were both fixated on an event which Napoleon um, had made all important, which was the decisive battle. Both of them understood the role of military strategy as being about creating the circumstances in which a battle would be fought in such a way that the enemy would be left at your political mercy. Once the enemy's army had been destroyed, then the enemy state had nowhere else to go. It had to accept terms. So the idea of battle was at the heart of strategy. It's important to note why strategy was so important um, as a very practical matter at this time, because the demands of moving armies, the logistical demands, the possibilities made open by cartography, by, by map making, uh, which was revolutionizing the way that armies thought about how they would go to battle. Jomini defined strategy in terms uh, of the war on the map. Uh, or it was the ability to get your force into the right place at the right time so that they could strike the decisive blow that was what a lot of strategy was about. And the aim was to create a situation from which no uh, opponent could recover. Clausewitz, in practice, and why he, he is still worth reading today, identified in his work the problems with this view. But in his own time, he didn't think that these problems were insuperable. The most important problem he identified, indeed one of the concepts with which he is now so closely identified, is the concept of friction. The basic idea that however much you may have worked out what you want to do and how you want to do it, something will come up that will get in the way, that will be an obstruction. In war, he said, everything is very simple, but the simplest things are very complicated. And um, the idea of the fog of war, the uncertainties that uh, anybody who's been in combat, or indeed anybody who's tried to run a large organization knows all about, he identified this as a really practical problem. But he didn't see it as being decisive in undermining the move to the decisive battle. And the reason for that was that both sides would you have to deal with the same phenomenon. He understood it was a reason why complicated and clever plans might be difficult to fulfill, but he saw that as a reason not to try complicated and clever plans. He was wary about the idea of the surprise attack, about catching the enemy completely off guard. He thought it was best to stick to uh, movements that could be managed well, and if they reached obstacles, these could be overcome. 
The second factor he identified, which was relevant to this, was intelligence. If you have a plan, if you have a, uh, a way of going forward, but you suddenly find out that your enemy is doing something completely different to what you expect, then you might, might think this was a good reason to change your plan, even if you were midway through its implementation. But Clausewitz um, was very wary of intelligence reports. He assumed that these were largely rumors and more or less demoralizing. So he urged the general to tend to discount them. He wasn't after real-time intelligence. He couldn't get it. And he was all in favor of trying to assess the enemy prior to battle to work out their character, how they were likely to organize their forces, if they were bold, if they were cautious. But he was very wary about interfering with the plan once it was being implemented. His advice, if bad news was received, was to carry on. The third problem he identified was probably the one that gave him most concern. And one of the reasons why he was revising on war, his great book, uh, at the time of his death, um, and it provided an opening for those who were not so sure about the decisive battle. And this was the possibility that wars might be conducted in more limited ways and for more limited purposes than the grand battles that Napoleon um, had used in order to take whole countries uh, out, uh, out of a war to transform, them, to transform them into French clients. So Clausewitz was aware of the possibilities of more complex, more subtle wars than those fought for the higher stakes with um, a decisive battle. And he should have been, because if we um, think um, back to why Napoleon failed, the two campaigns that we mean, may now um, recall, uh, whose uh, anniversaries were also uh, considering at the moment. I, I suspect uh, Waterloo will be more marked in London maybe than in Paris. Um, but if you think not only of Waterloo, but of the Spanish campaign, where the idea of the guerrilla was first uh, mooted, where uh, a lot of the, uh, the fighters who gave Napoleon's troops trouble uh, were not properly disciplined, organized fighters, but were, were local people who took up arms against an invader and working with um, the regular forces caused a lot of difficulty. And then, of course, there's the Russian campaign. In interestingly, uh, both Clausewitz and Jomini were present um, uh, in, in uh, the time of Borodino. Uh, the great battle recorded not wholly accurately by Tolstoy in, in War and Peace. And of course, here was a defeat of the Russian army. At the end of the day, the Russians had lost more men and had, and had more had been taken prisoner, but the Russian army had not been defeated. And Napoleon knew this. And his army had already been exhausted um, and depleted by the drive towards the center uh, of Russia, towards Moscow. A man, when he found he could take the capital city, Moscow, he found uh, that it was empty, it was soon on fire, and he was stranded and had to go home. And he lost and was chased back um, again with militias. And this experience weighed heavily on Clausewitz. He wrote a very good book about the 1812 campaign um, and provided a warning 
about why it might actually be difficult to get the political result you wanted through decisive military means. And it pointed to the problem with just seeing strategy as the art of the general, because the general may be able to find ways to use armed forces to get, uh, to defeat the opponent. But that does not mean to say that it will get the political result that is required. And it is the political purposes of war uh, by which, in the end, they are to be judged. And of course, Clausewitz, in his most famous aphorism, that war um, is the pursuit of politics by other means, polit uh, political ends by other means, understood that, but actually his theory was very much about the military sphere itself. The politics, in some way, was taken for granted. Now, these sorts of difficulties got worse during the course of the 19th century. Yet, for some reason, the idea of the decisive battle was never relinquished. It was clung to by the professional armed forces uh, as a way of justifying all their thinking and all of their preparations because it put them in the position of being the ones that would, in the end, carry the fate of the nation in their hands. It would be their responsibility, and they could do it. There were ways of doing it. And even as the problems of modern warfare accumulated, even as it became apparent that modern munitions and weaponry was making it harder and harder to win on the day without terrible costs, way arguments were found. For example, in France, Dupic, with his... Uh, belief in the offensive, belief in the, mor in the moral uh, strength of the soldier committed uh, to his country, to his cause, and imbued with the, the spirit of the offensive, uh, would be able to redress the odds that apparently would be uh, otherwise in favor of the defensive. What, of course, scared the... Uh, the military, was the idea uh, of a war of attrition, the, uh, by which they essentially meant a war which dragged on without a decisive battle, without any obvious ways of bringing it to a conclusion other than the exhaustion of one side before the other. And of course, they had a model of this in the American Civil War, but to some extent, that was overtaken by the speed with which um, uh, von Moltke's German forces, Prussian forces, defeated France in, in uh, 1870. Although again, of course, the aftermath of that war ending uh, with the Commune uh, was again another indication of why battles were not necessarily decisive. It was the German historian Delbruck who uh, made the sharp distinction between what he called wars of annihilation and wars of exhaustion, in which the wars of annihilation would be those as the military wanted, the decisive military action, whereas the wars of exhaustion would be those where all sorts of means would have to be used to wear down the opponent. And one can only look back at the irritation shown by the German general staff with Delbruck's ideas to see how resistant they were. Yet, when it came to the 1914 war, the German plan for a war of annihilation failed. And with that failure came the, uh, the war of attrition, which Germany eventually lost, that we are starting to mark uh, 
this year. Even in 1939-40, uh, the German uh, belief that in the possibilities of a decisive battle was shown initially with some success this time with the Blitzkrieg, taking countries out of the war, but not yet winning the war because there was always somebody else still there. And of course, uh, so convinced did Hitler become in the Blitzkrieg uh, that he thought he could use it against Russia uh, and in the end had the same fate um, as Napoleon. Even when you look at developments in naval and air warfare, you see through um, with naval warfare in the 19th century and then into air warfare in the 20th century, still the same focus on the decisive battle. Interestingly, um, Alfred Mann, the uh, great theorist of sea power in the United States, was the son of a teacher at West Point who was completely convinced by the ideas of Germany. And when Mann talked about actual sea warfare, he had in mind a decisive battle to get control of the sea. When the first theorists of air power came along, um, the Italian Due, uh, the American Billy Mitchell, they too used the same inspiration because just as Mann had talked about control of the sea, they talked about control of the air. And again, they had in mind some battle by which they would um, obliterate the enemy air force or else be able to get in their first blow so quickly to take out the um, uh, enemy population to the degree that they would be asking for mercy. But what we know and what was already apparent and certainly became apparent after the experience of the Second World War was that both maritime warfare and air warfare in the end had its effect by what they did to civilian economies and infrastructure. It was the blockades that made the final difference in 1918 because of the exhaustion of, of the belligerents. It was the attacks on the fuel and infrastructure, more so than on the populations, that uh, broke much of the German ability to resist. Our memories of the Second World War are in part some of the great battles, but also the way that civilians were drawn more and more into not just being the uh, impetus behind, war, behind wars, the, the providers of manpower, but also the victims and the targets. This had begun to a degree in the First World War, but moved to a new scale in the Second World War. And then, of course, it reached its uh, culmination in August 1945 with nuclear weapons. I spent most, much of my early career um, trying to deal with issues of nuclear strategy. And what struck me, even when I was doing that, was the extent to which still this belief in the possibility of a decisive military victory uh, influenced the way that the armed forces talked about the possible use of nuclear weapons. It was called a first strike. It was going to disarm the enemy of their nuclear weapons before they had a capacity to retaliate. And during the 1950s, many schemes were developed and much anxiety was expressed about the possibility of facing a nuclear Pearl Harbor. But in the end, as was recognized by the 1960s, both sides 
had a capacity in a phrase that was intended to say exactly what it said. There was a capacity for mutual assured destruction. Both sides could destroy the other. And if that was the case, what was the point of initiating a war other than the possibility that the other side might be more risk averse than you and lose their nerve in some terrible game of chicken before you did. There was talk of a crystal ball effect. If in 1914 those who led our nations to war had known how it would end up, would they have looked a little harder at the diplomatic possibilities, wondered whether the issues at stake were quite worth the blood and treasure that was going to be expended on their behalf. With nuclear weapons, there was no excuse. The crystal ball told you what was likely to happen, and it was sufficient to get political leaders to hold back. Look at the conversations between uh, Kennedy and Khrushchev at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the letters that they sent to each other. And you see, on, with both men, a fear uh, of where this could lead. Kennedy had just read the famous book by the American historian Barbara Tuchman called The Guns of August. And he remarked uh, that history wouldn't be very impressed with a book entitled The Missiles of October. That fear of things getting out of hand and escalating to a complete catastrophic conflagration was one of the factors, not the only factor, but one of the factors which kept the Cold War cold. Because both sides understood the dangers of trying to use military means to advance their positions. The Cold War had a lot of military activity to its margins, but by and large, the superpowers were very careful about how they handled it. And we have seen since the end of the Cold War a considerable amount of military activity. But what we haven't seen is great power war. What we have seen is a different sort of military campaign uh, undertaken by and large um, in weak and fragile states, uh, often uh, in the face of intercommunal violence to deal with humanitarian distress, the sort of issues France is dealing with at the moment uh, in the Central African Republic. And what we have learned, sometimes more than once, uh, over the period since the end of the Cold War, but also going back to the colonial wars and Vietnam and Afghanistan, is that um, these are highly political campaigns. And the critique that was developed of the American approach to Vietnam in the mid-60s and then later to the, to the approach adopted in Iraq um, and Afghanistan, is it still relied too much on the idea of defeating a military opponent? It still relied too much on the idea that uh, if you could just reduce the enemy strength to a low number, that then they would have to give in. Whereas in practice, it is the integration of the military and the political, about giving people confidence about the future, of a sense of good governance, uh, that things might get better, that uh, the so-called hearts and minds issues um, that uh, have been seen to be as important. Now, again, we can talk about hearts and minds 
uh, which is, can also be a problematic concept because it suggests just being nice um, uh, to, the, to a population and they'll all come on your side. It's more complex than that. My only point is to stress that these wars bring home the essentially political character of even military strategy. Now, from all of this, what might we draw about a general approach to strategy? For the second part of my talk, that's what I want to consider. If you think back to where I started, it's with the idea of strategy leading to a plan, and that plan being set by a very clear objective, which is the defeat of the enemy armed forces. The idea that strategy is about, a, the idea that strategy is synonymous with a plan is very strong. It's certainly strong in business literature, in organizational literature, when people say they want a strategy, they want a plan. They think that they see strategy as being about long-term thinking with a clear objective in mind and defining a sequence of steps that will get you to that point. I'm suggesting a strategy is something very different. It isn't a plan. Now we have um, no less an authority than von Moltke, uh, who famously observed that no plan survives contact with the enemy. My own personal favorite is the boxer Mike Tyson, who said more or less the same thing when he observed that everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, the problem about strategy as a plan is it misses the essence of strategy, which is that there is more than one actor involved. It's not just the problem of friction, which can be very practical and technical things, questions of terrain, of the weather, but the fact that you're dealing with a willful opponent who is trying to frustrate your plan and has a plan of their own. Or that you have allies who are on your side who claim to want the same objectives as you, but they do so in their own way, with a different set of priorities perhaps, or different assumptions about the opponent. The reason that strategy isn't a plan in the sense of a clearly set out sequence of moves, one following naturally upon the other, the reason it can't be like that is because of others. It's as simple as that. Moreover, we know from experience from all the conflicts that we talk about, that whatever people thought was going to happen when they started, the end results were quite different, sometimes better, sometimes worse, more often worse. So we know that even if you've set an objective, during the course of a campaign, you're as likely as not going to have to reappraise it, try to think, of alternative ways of reaching your objective and uh, may well end up in a completely different place to the one you imagined. And then, of course, there's the question of, um, of defense. A lot of the time when we're talking about strategy as setting a plan for the, the future, ambitious long-term goals, we're assuming that we have the initiative, that we're the ones who are going to start all this off. But many times with a military campaign, somebody else has taken the initiative 
and you're trying to work out how to respond. You're on the defensive. And your first priority, however much you may be thinking about uh, some eventual victory, your first priority is survival. It's not a long-term objective, it's a very immediate objective, uh, and how you survive may have important uh, consequences for how you go about um, how you go about your action. So, given this, how might one start to think about strategy? What is it that might give you confidence that you will be uh, successful? What is it that will determine if not necessarily a military, maybe a military victory, but in the end a political victory as well. Well, there's a very simple answer to that. Um, one that is surprisingly absent from most discussions uh, of strategy is that it helps a lot to be stronger than your opponent. If you've got more resources, if you've got a bigger army, if you've got um, better equipment, by and large, you should win. Now, we can think of the circumstances where the stronger army, the, the greater firepower, the advanced equipment will be irrelevant. But as often as not, if you look politically and military, that's a pretty good basis for success. There's a famous line from the Bible, from Ecclesiastes, which observes that the battle, the fight doesn't always go to the strongest, and the race doesn't always go to the most swift. But the American Damon Runyon observed, they're the ones to bet on. The strongest and the fastest, by and large, will win the fight or will, or will win the race. But that sort of strategy isn't very interesting. Um, it's the application of superior strength isn't very interesting. And so you'll find a lot of the writing on strategy isn't about just having more resources than your opponent. It's about being cleverer than your opponent. It's about outwitting your opponent. And if here, of course, the standard text is the Chinese um, strategist from 500 BC, Sun Tzu. Um, and Sun Tzu is beloved by strategists, especially in the business world, um, but I think elsewhere, in part because it's a book with some many catchy aphorisms, uh, it's easy to quote, it seems very profound, but the basic message is quite simple with Sun Tzu. Essentially, you're cleverer than your opponent, and whatever he thinks you're going to do, you do the opposite. He thinks you're going to attack, you defend. He thinks you're going to defend, you attack. He thinks you're weak, you've got to show that you're strong. He thinks you're strong, you pretend to be weak. You get the idea. Uh, and uh, it's based on deception. It's based um, on good intelligence. Uh, and it assumes uh, that your opponent isn't as clever as you. This is a very dangerous uh, assumption to make. Uh, if both parties have read Sun Tzu, um, then you may never engage at all. Um, everybody is... Uh, uh, being more cunning than everybody else. And indeed, there, there is uh, some fascinating work, indeed, done in Paris, I believe, um, that, that, that shows how uh, Chinese rhetoric, which reflects these same sort of ideas, never quite getting to the point um, of relying on illusion, um, uh, is one reason why Chinese discussions can go on and on and on. Um, 
whereas those of us in more Western traditions like to get to the point more quickly. Uh, I like to cite the example of David and Goliath um, as a reason to be cautious about the idea of deception um, and cunning uh, because this is the iconic um, example of the underdog strategy based on outwitting the opponent. And uh, you, of course, know the story of um, the challenge made by Goliath to the Israelites to find a champion uh, who would take him on in combat and victory would go to the side whose champion won. And the Israelites were afraid until the shepherd boy comes along and without any obvious credentials uh, is allowed to go and fight Goliath, which he does using his sling, some stones from a stream. He knocks Goliath over while Goliath is coming towards him and then has his head chopped off. Uh, and that's the story of David and Goliath. Um, I, I'm tempted, but I won't go into the recent reinterpretation of this um, by uh, Gladwell, um, who has written yet another book, uh, which has David and Goliath as its, as its heading, uh, because I think he totally misinterprets the Bible story. Um, I think the important point about the Bible story, actually, is why wasn't King Saul the champion? Because King Saul was the first king of the Jews, first king of the Israelites, and he'd been chosen because he was a warrior. Before Ham, they'd been run by prophets. Now they had a warrior. King Saul turned out to be very cautious. The reason why the Bible wants us to believe David was successful was not that he was cleverer than Goliath, but because he believed in God. He trusted God. He had a great ally in God. And if he didn't believe in God, or if God hadn't been there, he was taking quite a risk because it's not hard to work out some possibilities. What would have happened if David Stone had missed by a couple of millimeters and pinged off the top of Goliath's helmet? He wouldn't have had a second chance. Even if he'd been successful this time, the next time David went into battle with, with just with uh, stones, they would know what was coming. They would be prepared for him. They would, he wouldn't be allowed to do the same trick twice. And it relied still on the Philistines accepting this as a legitimate way of winning the battle. They didn't have to accept that as the result. And it's quite an interesting feature of the, um, of, of the crafty figure throughout history. Think Odysseus from, um, from Homer, uh, who again relied a lot on being more cunning than his opponent. But in the end, even when he was telling the truth, people didn't believe him because his reputation went before so I'm not saying that being cleverer, being deceptive, being cunning can never have a strategic value. That would be silly. But the idea that this is the alternative seems to me to be overstated. There is a third possibility. Um, and in the book, um, I raise this right at the start by looking at primates, by looking at chimps. Um, which may be a surprising way to start, but if you look at the behavior of apes, um, when, the, when an alpha male is being challenged, it isn't on the basis of brute force. What the challenger does is find a friend, makes an alliance, has a coalition, and gradually, with his ally, undermines the alpha male who sees his position eroding. And it struck me when I first read these accounts that this is basic to most of the strategy 
that we engage in as well. That it, um, that, that what is critical is not necessarily brute force, but the ability to forge alliances. And just to conclude and to pull together a number of these points, I want to take an example um, from May 1940, from when Britain found itself uh, alone, um, facing the Battle of Britain. Churchill had just become Prime Minister, um, and he was immediately uh, pressed with the possibility of making a peace with Germany. And this was a serious debate. His memoir suggests it was dismissed completely, but it wasn't, and it couldn't have been. And they decided not um, to seek peace terms with Germany, um, not because it might never happen, but because it didn't need to happen at this point. And if they were seen to have gone for peace terms, it would have been demoralizing and therefore made the military position even weaker. And that if peace terms had to be found, it was better that they were found um, when there was more military strength. But Churchill's problem at that point was defensive. His basic challenge was survival. And that's what his speeches were about, and that's what British activity was about. But unlike his predecessor, he did try to think about how victory might come. And the only way he could think of it was by getting an ally. And the only ally he could think of was the United States. And so he began a correspondence with President Roosevelt, which his predecessor Chamberlain had not had, which gen gradually was important in creating the relationship that flourished completely after Pearl Harbor in December 1941. And at the time of Pearl Harbor, Churchill observed, so we had won after all. There were a number of years with war to go. But he knew at that point that the alliance that had been forged was not going to be beaten. And of course, by this time, Soviet Russia was in as well. And when Churchill, who was an old anti-Bolshevik, was asked, how is it that you can embrace an alliance with Joseph Stalin? He observed in the House of Commons that even if Hitler had attacked Hades, he would have a good word to say for Satan in Parliament. He understood that coalitions were critical. Churchill had many flaws when it came to military uh, ventures, but he understand, understood the grand politics of the conflict. So to conclude, what I'm trying to say about strategy is not that it's impossible, though it's certainly very difficult, not that it doesn't involve forward, -looking, forward looks, and even planning. But in practice, it's going to be, have to be flexible and agile. It starts not with an end point, but with where you are at the moment, with the problem at hand. And how you address the problem at hand will get you to a new stage where you can think about the next set of problems. The danger, the difficulty of thinking about strategy in terms of an end point is that the end never comes. Because even if you've reached a particular objective, you've defeated the enemy forces, you've got an unconditional surrender, or you've won an election, or you've been successful in a takeover bid, if any of the, you then got another set of problems. You've got to work out what to do with the defeated country. You've got to work out how to govern the country. You've got to work out how to merge two organizations or whatever. At the end of the book, I talk about strategy in terms of narratives and scripts and so on. But the point is, it seems to me it's like a soap opera. It never, 
it has one episode after another. And each episode depends on the one that has gone before. Eisenhower once observed um, that plans are useless, planning is essential. And that's true of strategy. Uh, it's an essential process. It's essential to think about the possibilities of the future, to tell stories about the future that we can imagine how it will work. As long as you remember to include all the other parties in that story and try to anticipate how they will act. But it's a story that will need to be improvised and to be adjusted as time goes on. So in that sense, to me, strategy is a story told in the future, future tense. But it is no more than a story. And what actually happens in reality will depend on your ability to recognize what's changed, to recognize the challenges you didn't expect, and possibly to exploit possibilities you didn't imagine would come your way. Thank you very much.